Glad to see you. I'm kind of on the spot. The boss wants me to take a shot at front end work. I've been trying to bone up on the subject. But I never was good in that, so when they start talking about steering geometry and all that other stuff, heck, I'm sunk. Relax, kid. Yeah, you, you've got nothing to worry about. All you've got to learn is how to find out if them front wheels are straight. A Roy ought to... Uh-oh. Here he comes now. Ready to give Jack a hand on that front end, Louie? Sure. As long as I don't have to know all the fancy stuff in these books. Well, Louie, with independent front wheel suspension, it's a lot simpler now than when most of those books were written. You see, independent front wheel suspension and low pressure tires changed a lot of ideas about what's needed and what's no longer necessary in the way of front wheel alignment. When we had a rigid front axle, we had to tip the front wheels out at the top a trifle because that axle had a tendency to sag under load. When you did that, the wheels would be straight up when the car was full of people. We still set them that way on trucks, you know. Sure. But with present-day suspensions and tires, wheels can be designed to be straight when assembled. As a matter of fact, Louis, of all the things you've read about, only two can be adjusted. The way the wheels slant and the way they point. It takes damaged parts to upset the other settings. Gee, and how come Jack always checks every new car before we deliver it? Well, that's easy, Louie. First, like every good mechanic I know, he's checking safety features. The only adjustment you'll ever catch him making on a new front end is to see that the wheels point straight ahead. Yep, until you've put around a thousand miles on a new car, it's too stiff to settle down to exactly the same place. So each time you check it, you may get a different reading, although it's probably okay all the time. Then there's no point in really going over a front end until the thousand mile inspection, is there? Except for safety, that is. No, if you change anything, you'll probably put a perfectly good front end out of line, because them early measurements don't mean nothing. There's really just one thing to remember about front ends, Louis. Cars handle best, and tires wear longest when wheels are straight. That means they should point straight and should stand straight up and down. Then how come we have any figures at all on front end alignment? They're like any other tolerance figures, Louis. Gives you a little leeway to work on and still keep you out of trouble. I get it. It's just how much you can get off from being exactly straight. What do you check first, Roy? Suppose we let Jack answer that. Well, first I check the car out to see how it steers. That may tell me something, and then... Hey, hey, not so fast, Jack. I've heard a lot of guys argue there ain't much you can tell about what's wrong with the front end by how it steers. That's for sure, Tech. And wrong ideas about that have led to a lot of front end work that wasn't necessary at all. Actually, as Jack knows... Pulling to one side or the other is the only kind of steering trouble that's caused by a front end that's out of line. That's right, Roy. Now, that's usually because the front wheels aren't straight up and down. You've had a roll of wheel and tire down the road to the nearest filling station to get it fixed sometime, haven't you, Louie? Sure have. Chased the darn thing all over the street. It just wouldn't roll straight. Well, that's just because you couldn't keep that wheel up straight. As soon as it leaned over a little to one side or the other, it would roll in that direction. That's why when I road test a car, if it seems to pull toward one side of the road all the time, I know that one front wheel is leaning out at the top in that direction. 
Unless, of course, the tire on that side is old and worn. But it's really the front tires that tell me the most about the front end, because they'll show signs of unusual wear. For instance, if the wheels don't point straight, you get a scuffing action and wear down the edge of each rib. That's because the tires are actually being shoved a little bit sideways all the time. You've seen midget races and how the boys skid the cars around the turn. Well, that really chews the rubber off those rear tires. Well, you're doing the same thing to front tires when you run them out of line. You're grinding the rubber off from the outside toward the inside if the wheels are too close together at the front. Yeah, you can tell wheels that are towed in too much because the outer edge of each rib will be stuffed off. Toe out wear is just the opposite. On a highly crowded road, you'll get an even faster rate of wear on the outside of the right tire for excessive toe in and on the inside of the left tire for excessive toe out. That's different from the kind of way you get on a tire that leans out at the top too much. That will wear from the center toward the outside, and it will be even wear, not stuck. You know, if we could always drive on a perfectly flat surface like the salt flats and the wheels were straight, the wear would be even and everything would be lovely. But roads aren't level. Most of them are crowned or slanted. So if the wheels are straight, the wear's bound to be more on one side than the other. Of course, if we could drive on the left side of the road, we'd sort of even up for the wear we get by always driving on the right side. But Yeah, and keep the undertakers in business, unless that road happens to be a one-way highway. But look, Roy, this tire's got something different again. The tread's kind of cupped out in spots all around. That happens occasionally, Louis. But the chief thing to remember is that it isn't caused by a front end out of line. Instead, it may be a combination of the road conditions, the extra bounce you get on front wheels, and even the tire itself. Then, too, if the air pressure isn't right, or if the tire tread isn't exactly uniform, cupping may start. It's more likely to happen on new tires than on ones already broken in. So what do you do? Simple, kid. You just crisscross the tires every 2,500 miles. <laughs> Nothing to it. Gosh, Jack, I'm beginning to wonder what they have you around here for. Just to change tires? <laughs> There's a little more to it than that, Louis. You see, when a car like this comes in, we have to be sure the wheels are just as straight as we can get them. From every angle. Those angles are where it gets complicated for me. Don't worry about the angles. Just remember that you want the wheels straight. Straight ahead, straight up and down. You know they're straight ahead if they're the same distance apart at the front and the back. They can point in a little, but it better not be more than a sixteenth of an inch. That's called toe in. Then you have to see they don't lean. It's pretty hard to get them exactly straight up and down. So the big job to see just how much they're off. You measure that in degrees, and it's called Camber. You mean that's all camber is? Just how much the wheel leans? That's all, bud. Of course, if you want to get technical, you say it's positive when it leans out. But if it leans in like it's not supposed to, you naturally call it negative. The main thing you want to remember about camber, Louis, is that both wheels have got to be set at the same angle if you want the car to run straight ahead. One wheel with more camber than the other will make the car pull to that side, like I told you a few minutes ago. Now you know about the only two things we can adjust, toe in and camber. The other things simply have to be checked to be sure that the original setting hasn't been changed by a bent or damaged part. I'll tell you more about it when we make the test. Well, let's get going and get some work done on this car. I still want to know where we begin. Okay, let's turn the record over and find out. This is one time we work from the ground up. Right. We got to have a true surface to work from, or we'll end up more out of line than when we started. That's what those four white spots painted on the floor are for. We know the floor is level right there. That on the level, Jack? That's <laughs> no joke, Sam. If all four wheels aren't level, you're wasting your time. And besides that, We've got to be sure about the gauge we use, too. A sharp bump can put it offline. That's why I recheck it practically every time I use it. You're going to be accurate if nothing else, Louis, before we get through with you. 
First thing for you to do, Louie, is to check the tire pressure. They all got to be equal. And weight's got to be normal. So take a look-see in the trunk. A lot of stuff in there could throw us off, too. Now I'll spot the turntable. They let you turn the wheels and tell you how much angle you got. They also let the wheels spread out to their natural position. So we're sure of getting true readings when we make our check. Want to drive the car on, Louie? Okay, that's good. Now I'll slip the jack under the front end and we'll check for run out. Holding a piece of chalk against the rim, like this, tells us where any high point is. As much as a sixteenth won't do any harm, but will upset our instrument reading. So we've got to know where it is so we don't put the gauge right on it. That's why before we let the car down on the turntable, we rotate the wheel so the chalk mark is at the side. Hey, is that bouncing part of the act? Sure is, small fry. It makes sure the car settles to its natural position. Louie, be sure the front wheels are straight, will you? In the meantime, I'll clamp the brake pedal down so the front wheels can't rotate any while we're checking. Now, with the trim ring off, the gauge sets against the inner shoulder of the rim, Louie. As soon as I adjust it for level, tell me what it reads. Just a hair over half a degree, Jack. That okay? Sure is, since it's positive. A quarter of a degree is preferred, but as long as we're between zero and three quarters positive, we shouldn't monkey with it. Right, Jack. No sense spending a lot of time trying to hit a figure right on the nose when you get the same good results anywhere within limits. The only time you might make changes inside the limit is when you don't want both wheels to be the same. I thought that was never. Well, suppose a car's being driven on highly crowned roads most of the time. It tends to run to the right all the time. But if we set the right wheel at zero camper and the left wheel at maybe half a degree positive, what would happen? Why, that car would pull to the left. Sure, on a level road. And on the crown roads, it would make it easier to hold the car straight. Gosh, that's right. Don't forget, that's only for an unusual condition, Louis. And in any case, you have to keep within the limits, or you'll get into tire wear trouble. To get back to this car, since both front wheels are practically straight up, it looks like something else must have caused the cup tire wear. But suppose I show you how to adjust the wheel slant if it's needed. Just a minute. Suppose you guys step back, and I'll fix it so we can all see. All clear? Watch out. How's that for getting the fender off? <laughs> Wish I could do it that easy. Sure make my job a snap. Well, Louie, you loosen the lock screw, and then turn this eccentric pushing. That tips the top of the support arm in or out to change wheel strength. But... Don't give it more than half a turn, because then you'll go back the other way. But suppose that isn't enough to take care of the job. It always is enough, Louie, unless something's bent, the spindle or one of the arms. I was about checking the kingpin angle to see what's bent. Kingpin angle? What's that? Oh, Tex talking about the kingpin being tilted toward the center of the car. It makes steering easier, but it's built into the job. So you can't change it. If it's off, it's just another proof that something's bent. The main thing to remember about kingpin inclination, Louis, is that it's built in to make our cars handle easier. But there's another angle of the kingpin to check. That's to be sure the pin doesn't slant toward the front or toward the rear, at least more than one degree either way. That slant's called caster. Like your book probably said, it used to be needed with the old hard tires and rigid front axle to help bring the car out of a turn. You know how a kid rides a bike no hands? But he can do it because the front wheel pivots at an angle, as caster, so it tends to go straight. But with our present tires and front end design, we don't need caster anymore. By eliminating it, we can cut down steering effort. Looks like it is with camber, too. If you have any, it's got to be the same on both wheels, or the car will pull to one side. I checked this car for caster while Roy was talking. It's okay on both wheels, so that just leaves toe in. First, we just scribe a line down the center of each tire. Then, measuring between those lines tells us whether the tires are closer together at the front 
than at the back. If the front distance is shorter than the back by only a sixteenth or less, like this is, we're okay. If it's wrong, you correct it by turning the tie rod. And, of course, you'd have to turn them both the same amount. Otherwise, our steering wheel and gear won't remain properly centered. Tell me, Jack, what makes a car wander from one side to the other? If it isn't caused by lack of lubrication, then it's due to not enough clearance between the steering knuckle and its thrust bearing. It's corrected by removing shims between the bearing and the knuckle. There's another somewhat similar condition we hear about once in a while, too. That's when the car seems to dark suddenly when one wheel runs up on a streetcar track, for example. It's not serious, and ordinarily we don't try to correct it, because all you can do is tighten everything up, which makes the car steer hard. Well, I guess that's about it. You sure you didn't leave out something? Or am I just imagining the tires are cupped? No. Nope. They got cupping all right, but this front end checked up perfect, so it must be something else. So we don't touch the front end after all. Right, kid. And believe me, a lot of perfectly good front ends wouldn't be bollocked up if more guys understood that poor alignment don't cause cupping. Yeah, but what do we do about cupping? First, we have to recognize what causes cupping. For one thing, New tires have to be broken in just like anything else. Usually they wear in fine, but some start to wear unevenly. So, by switching tires crosswise from front to rear, we can be pretty sure it'll stop cupping. The rear tires are broken in, so there's not much chance they'll cup on the front. And the driving action will smooth out cup spots on the tires you put on the rear. Air pressure is important, too. A soft tire will wear a lot faster than one that's right. Say, speaking of tires, do these new super cushion tires make any difference on front end check? They don't make a bit of difference in front end measurements, but they sure make the car ride like a dream. Well, Louie, let's get these tires crisscrossed. Maybe Tech can reverse his magic and get that fender back on for us. <laughs> sure can. Always glad to help a pal. Just keep out of range, fellas. Well, there you are, Louis. You've learned you don't have to be scared by front end alignment. That's right. It's a cinch. You just gotta keep them wheels straight. <laughs>